this is working? It's working? Okay, thank you. Okay, it feels quite awkward sitting, but hi, everybody. <laughs> um, thank you for joining today. My name is Alexandra Robinson. I'm the Gender-Based Violence Technical Advisor for, United, uh, for the United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA. Um, and today we welcome everyone to our event um, on Disrupt Harm, Accountability for a Safer Internet. Um, so ending gender-based violence and harmful practices is at the center of what UNFPA do. Um, and increasingly in a digital world, we realize that we can't achieve that without ensuring that all women and girls are safe in all spaces, um, including online spaces and through their use of technology. So we're, we are hosting the event today uh, to explore those mechanisms through which law and policy and civil society movements are operating to disrupt that harm um, experienced by women in online spaces and technology. And we're gonna hear from um, a really amazing panel. I feel really privileged to be sitting here um, with such phenomenal people. Um, but we will hear from a range of different perspectives, um, their wealth and experience across um, their work in, in doing exactly this and disrupting harm. We'll then open um, for a Q&A both with online, um, we, we have an online presence, so we'll, we'll have a Q&A with you in the room, but also with Q&A uh, for people online. So, and we're a relatively small room, so please don't be shy in taking the microphone and, and, um, and asking. Um, with that, I will turn to um, our uh, first panelist, uh, who is Senator Martha Lucia Michia Camarena, known as Malu Michia. Uh, she is a staunch feminist. Um, she is the Morena Senator for Guanajuato. She is a mother. She is a federal or has been a federal representative on three occasions, currently a legislator in the Congress of Union representing the state of Guanajuato. And she will speak specifically around the legal measures and regulations implemented in Mexico for the prevention and response of technology facilitated gender-based violence. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you for inviting me. Nice to meet you and thank you very much for this invitation. Um, well, good afternoon, I am Marta Lucia Micher Camarena, a Mexican senator, and today I want to share the current situation of women, adolescents, and girls regarding information and communication technologies. Uh, I now want to address an important and troublesome issue, digital violence, which according to the UN, three out of 10 women internet users in Mexico have been victims of cyberbullying that is approximately 10 million women. In addition, the National Front uh, for Sorority and Digital Defenders, a Mexican civil society organization, an NGO, has indicated that uh, 19 five out of every 100 victims of digital violence are women, pointing out that 74.1% uh, of women victims of digital violence are between 18 and 30 years old. 72.3% uh, are university students and 81.6% of the aggressors are a known person, mainly former partners. Among the main behaviors reported by this violence are dissemination of intimate content without consent, threats of dissemination, harassment, and or sexual harassment, extortion or sexor sexortion, sexual assaults not related to sexual intimacy, distribution of child pornography, production of intimate content without consent, dissemination of personal data offering sexual services without consent, and identity theft. The main formats, formats in which uh, digital aggressions occur are intimate photo sharing groups of, uh, or websites, direct message, creation of fake profiles, and attack from fake profiles. Well, currently I chair, I chair the Gender Equality Committee in the Mexican Senate 
a legislative space that has allowed me to create, contribute, and adapt legislation, legislation to current times. Thus, we are not only concerned, but we have also dealt, dealt or dealt, dealt, dealt with legislating important reforms that provide safety of women in digital space. Well, the reform, and it was uh, approved in unanimidad. How do you say unanimity? Everyone. Uh -huh. See, the reform entails the following: define digital violence as any malicious action carried out through the use of information and communication technologies by which images, audios, or real or simulated videos of intimate sexual content of a person without their consent, without their approval, or without their authorization are exposed, distributed, distributed disseminated, exhibited, transmitted, marketed, offered, exchanged, or shared without cause, with, with cause, psychological, and emotional harm, as well as damage any area of the person's private life or own image. It also includes those malicious acts that cause damage to the intimacy, privacy, and or dignity of women which are committed through information and communication technologies. Second, regulates protection orders for digital violence cases in which the public prosecutor's office or judge will immediately order the necessary protection measures, introducing electronic or in grinding the companies of digital platforms, the media, social of website, website pages, individuals, or companies to interrupt, block, destruct, or delete image, Im image, audios, or videos related to the investigation. And third, adds the crime of violation of sexual intimacy, intimacy punishable by a penalty of three to six years in prison to anyone who discloses, shares, distributes, or publishes image, videos, or audios of uh, intimate sexual content of a person who is a legal age uh, without the person's consent, approval, or authorization, as well as anyone who videotapes, audio tapes, photographs, prints, or develops image, audios, or videos with intimate sexual content of a person without their consent, without their approval, or without their uh, uh, authorization. Well, I am convinced that one of the best ways to achieve women, adolescents, and girls' safety is to provide an applicable legal framework to face situations that cause serious harm to their lives. Never take one step back on women's rights. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I, I think that set the stage for the entire event very well. Um, I. I, well, we'll now introduce the other panelists who'll be um, who'll be speaking with us today. Um, we have Sherry Kram Talabani, who um, is uh, sitting right next to the senator, um, who is the executive director of the Seed Foundation. Um, Sherry is a human rights lawyer and has over twenty years of experience in as a policymaker, program manager, and advocate for gender and human rights and social justice. And today she'll be speaking to us specifically around um, contemporary legal frameworks and political discourses on technology facilitated GBV in Iraq. Um, and then sitting on the other side of Sherry, uh, we have uh, Carla Velasco Ramos, the policy advisor coordinator at the Association for Progressive Communications. And Carla has many ex years of experience in internet access, gender, and technology. And with the APC, plays a crucial role in convening CSOs, tech companies, and online platforms to address TFGBB. And then we will be speaking with our eSafety Commissioner, uh, Julie Inman Grant, um, one of the only intergovernmental regulatory bodies in the world committing to committed to keeping citizens safer online. Um, the eSafety Commissioner has extensive experience in the nonprofit and government sectors and has spent two decades working in senior public policy and safety roles in the tech industry, um, including at Microsoft, Twitter, and Adobe. And as the Commissioner plays an important role um, as the 
a global chair, glo as a, an important global role um, as the chair of the Child Dignity Alliance's technical working group, a board member of the We Protect Global Alliance, um, and the commissioner also serves on the World Economic Forum's Global Coalition for Digital Safety and on their Exiled Eco <laughs> Ecosystem Governance Steering Committee on Building and Defining the Metaverse. I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, and finally, uh, we will um, conclude our panel uh, discussion with Juan Carlos Lara, who um, is the executive director at Derechos Digitales, an organization working at the intersection of human rights and digital technologies, um, where um, he is a lawyer by training and has experience in legal and policy analyst and research on data privacy, surveillance, freedom of expression, and access to knowledge in the digital environment. So. With that, I will now turn um, to you, Sherry. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for hosting us. Um, I think at the at the conference. Surprisingly, I'm not very tech savvy myself. Um, <laughs> um, so what I really wanted to do is drill down um, on what online violence means in Iraq, but I think also across the Middle East, because I think it's an area where we see very high internet penetration, um, but also very high rates of gender inequality extremely conservative norms, which creates unique vulnerabilities it, uh, of people are, who already have high vulnerabilities, um, and it exacerbates those. Um, so unique vulnerabilities to TFGBV and with real life uh, disastrous consequences for women um, and young girls. Um, we see TFGBV uh, endemic and increasing across the Middle East and Iraq. So Iraq is the fourth worst country in the world when it comes to uh, women's peace, security, access to justice, women's rights, and their safety. Um, and that's according to the Women, Peace, and Security Index. <coughs> and it relates to their participation in every aspect of life. We have the highest rate of intimate partner violence in the world. 45% of women face uh, violence in their home. So women aren't safe at home. And we have conservative norms that shape and constrain how women and girls, uh, what they can do um, and how they behave. Um, and we see adolescents and young women with extremely limited freedoms and spending a lot of their free time online. We have the largest gap globally. Um, it, it shows up in the economic sphere, in political participation, in education and health attainments, in their very survival, and we have very limited protections in place. At the same time, Iraq is very well connected. 75% of the population are active on the internet. Almost everybody has a cell phone. The gaps between women and men are, uh, exist, for sure, with uh, the biggest gap in connection with rural women. Um, and uh, with women lagging behind in terms of digital literacy. Nonetheless, 50% of women and girls in Iraq uh, say that they have faced and experienced TFGBV or know someone who has experienced it. In this context, with these social and cultural dynamics, women and girls are extremely vulnerable to online violence with the high likelihood that this violence um, shows up offline as well. So what are we worried about? much as what the senator just described, harassment, abuse, exploitation, trafficking. Um, we also see these phenomena lead to murder, honor killings, um, and increased rates of suicide. So what do we see? We see image-based abuse, just what you just described, private photo or image or film, um, sometimes real and sometimes manipulated, used to exploit sextortion, uh, used to traffic, um, used, um, in every economic strata uh, uh, in our society uh, for women and girls. And besides the violence that women and girls face from the perpetrator or the person that's abusing them online, 
um, we also see them face uh, extremely high rates of violence in their home life as a result of this threat and uh, of this violence. So it really, if their families find out, it could lead to, to honor-based violence and murder. And it has, and we have that many cases of this. Um, harassment, threats, and defamation. And it's against women and girls generally, um, but it, it's especially um, a risk for women in the public space, academics, politicians, um, uh, NGO leaders, and women of every walk of life. And it's intended to inhibit and constrain women and girls' participation. Um, and so we see them being harassed and intimidated online. We've seen a spate of murders of social media influencers um, for dressing uh, what is perceived to be provocatively smoking um, and punishing them for going outside social norms. So it's violent and it's scary and it's intended to keep women's representation and participation low and it's very effective at that. We have other challenges with predatory practices, um, including of children through gaming, child porn, child trafficking rings, but these are less documented and well known. And of course, the most obvious and horrific abuse is that we saw women sold like chattel by ISIS online, and that fostered the, um, the trafficking of women during the ISIS crisis, which continues even to today online. So what do we need to do to address it? My organization two years ago started a nationwide task force. I think it's the only nationwide task force called the TFGBV task force. And you can find out and connect to our task force here. Um, we're focused on human rights-based legislation um, and policy across the Middle East and Iraq. Legislation to protect against these harms is often used to, to uh, decrease public expression, um, free media, um, and the response tends to be rules that inhibit and, and criminalize public ex expression. So we need to focus on the crime, um, but not on expression. We need increased access to safe and confidential reporting, along with investigations and protections from designated agencies with clear mandates and skilled personnel. Um, so we don't have that in Iraq today. We don't have a designated, uh, we do have some legislation, but we don't have a designated agency, and we certainly don't have um, investigations that are skilled or experienced. We also need skilled and experienced NGOs um, that understand this unique kind of crime and how it impacts women and girls across Iraq and, of course, the Middle East. Um, and this requires uh, serious training, capacity building, which are, we are undertaking. And then finally, we need to focus on the tech companies. They need to have proper redress that is both survivor-centered, rights-focused, um, including child rights focused, that understands how this type of online violence manifests into real world violence across the Middle, e Middle East in a unique way and develop appropriate safe responses for the environment that we face. So to close, we really need a regionalized local response um, in whatever internet governance architecture that emerges from these forums, whether it's the, the Global Digital Compact or other um, other thread, we need to address in these broad governance uh, mechanisms uh, the unique uh, and, and uh, unique uh, violence and, and considerations that we face across the Middle East. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sherry. Um, and to, to really to build on your work as, as a CSO in, in Iraq, um, I'll now turn to the Association for Progressive Communications who have demonstrated a long-standing ability to mobilize um, communities and community organizations around the issue of addressing tech-facilitated GBV. Um, I wondered if you could speak to the role of APC um, in shaping those movements, but also perhaps talk to some of the voices that you think might be missing from those movements. Yes, thank you. Um, so I am Carla, and I'm the policy advocacy coordinator of the Women's Rights Program, which is part of the Association for Progressive Communication. So today I'm going to speak on behalf of WRP and APC. Uh, the Association for Progressive Communications is a network organization. It's a members organization. Uh, we uh, have around 70 member organizations that work uh, in approximately 40 countries around the world, mostly of them 
uh, in the global south or in, ma in the majority world. So the work that we do with our member organizations since APC's inception, which, ba which was uh, almost 30 years ago, uh, is through the women's rights program uh, to, um, to work on women's rights, sexual rights and, and feminist movements. And back then when we started working um, with the women's rights programs, a language like online gender-based violence was something that didn't even exist, right? So it is a celebration for us that um, 25 years after we get to see uh, these issues in the agenda and we get to see that different governments are taking this, um, this very important issues into account and are these are being mentioned right now in at the Internet Governance Forums, um, at the Global Digital Compact and the in the different feminist foreign policies that are currently pushing the, this subject, right? So for us, um, it has been a major achieve to have this. Uh, uh, in 2022, um, the term was successfully recognized as a human rights violation. And it was um, thanks to the work of, of member organizations together with APC and with other uh, organizations from the feminist movements. And it has been um, uh, a successful work for us to be able to find a pathway beti between feminist organizations and digital rights organizations, right? Because that's also a very big struggle um, right now. So uh, for us, um, it is very important to bring into the digital space, the voices of women and people of diverse genders and sexualities. And the things that are very important and crucial right now uh, is that even though there is a discussion between online gender-based violence and uh, technology facilitated <laughs> gender-based violence, we need to go beyond uh, the discussion of the term and we really need to discuss the response and remedy to victims and, sur and survivors where they are. So for example, one of the things that I want to highlight here uh, is that we hear in many of the discussions um, th uh, the, the, the phrase, yes, uh, access and digital skills for women and girls as a possible solution to the problems that we have for gender. And my, my urgency here is to please go beyond that, you know, because access is only part of the problem. But what we really need to look at is the usage of, of the internet and how women and people of diverse genders and sexualities are connected, the issues that we face online and how we have um, differentiated, um, differentiated effect when we are using the internet, right? And how that crosses intersectionality and how that crosses where we come from, where are we connecting from, and it in intersects with race, gender, identity, sexuality, class, ethnicity. So we need to take all of these things into account. So once you look into or beyond the gender gap, you get to see that there's a lot of complexities around that. And we really need to focus on, on this. And this is what the members are currently asking for us to do, right? To bring the conversation beyond that, to bring technology facilitated gender-based violence, to bring uh, gender disinformation into the discussion, but also to change a little bit the narrative because we always think about the negative things and we always uh, see the negative uh, effects and impacts that we have. But for example, in APC, we have a vision of transformative justice. So we really, uh, the, the proposal that we have here and that we also um, show in our feminist principles of the internet is how through uh, bringing values such as pleasure, sexuality, joy, uh, freedom of expression, we, we get to change the narrative of how we see these issues um, uh, that are that we are currently facing as women and people of diverse genders and sexuality. So my time is up. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Carla. Um, um, and with that, I think, you know, an, another pathway around how we achieve those safe spaces for women and girls to enjoy technology and online spaces. We have Commissioner Iman Grant. Um, it would be lovely to hear from you about what, um, yeah, what, what, what does a regulatory body look like and how is that disrupting harm so that women can have a, a transformative experience online? Well, thank you. I'd also like to play off the really important discussion that has already been had and congratulate everyone for not using the term revenge porn. Um, when I was announced as e-safety commissioner, I was asked to set up a revenge porn portal and I said, yes, I will, but no, I will not call it revenge. Revenge for what? 
and porn not for the titillating purposes. We can't be using language that trivializes or victim blames. So it's so good to see that in many languages, in many contexts, that image-based abuse is being uh, adopted as uh, a much more in empowered uh, terminology. Um, I think it's really important. Uh, the 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 role that we have um, actually gives me a legislative role to coordinate all online safety uh, activity across the Commonwealth, um, but also to be the educator and the regulator for online safety. Now, I, I think it's really important we've heard this. There is no one size fits all. So when we're talking about prevention and education, um, it's really important to, to establish an evidence base and understand how the most vulnerable communities are being impacted and how it might be manifesting differently. So for instance, in Australia, uh, indigenous Australians are um, twice as likely to receive online hate than the broader general population. And the way the indigenous communities use technology is different. They tend to share devices, they tend to share passwords, it's a very um, familial base, but that also means then there are more imposter accounts and takeovers and lateral violence. But you also can't say there's a one size fits all for indigenous uh, communities. Um, the experiences of urban indigenous people are different from those in rural and remote communities. By the same token, in culturally and linguistically diverse communities, when we looked at technology facilitated abuse, not only there are they experiencing the harm and the mental and emotional distress that the everyday Australian is experiencing from technology facilitated abuse, they often have low digital lit literacy, low technology literacy. The man controls the technology in the home. There are additional threats of um, deportation. Uh, there may be you know, mistrust of police and government organizations um, and, um, and just general disenfranchisement from the community. Um, and then when we look at those with intellectual and dis uh, disabilities, um, these women are afraid to, to tell the truth. They're afraid that they will not be believed. And it's often their carers or their partners that control their technology and um, threaten to cup, cut them off from their, their, their peers and their friends. Um, and they may not have the capability of knowing where to report to or where to get help. So we do have this in the intersectional nature that we have to um, make sure that we understand we need to co-design solutions for prevention with these communities. Um, when we get to the protection side of things, um, to echo the senator's um, comments, because we take complaints from the pub public along around child sexual abuse material, around image-based abuse, around youth-based cyberbullying, and adult cyber abuse, Every single one of those forms of abuse is gendered. Um, yeah, the average age uh, for, for girls um, being bullied used to be 14. We're now getting reports from uh, girls as young as um, eight or nine years old. I've just issued end user powers against a group of six 14-year-old boys who are sending rape and death threats to another 14-year-old girl. Um, you know, we're helping women in Iran and Pakistan with um, Australian connections get their image-based abuse materials down um, because they're at risk of um, honor killings um, and um, you know a, a terrible shame that um, we don't experience it the same way in the Australian context um, and so we're now issuing some remedial, remedial directions against some of those people. Um, so using these deterrent powers and naming and shaming uh, does have an impact. We have a 90% success rate in terms of getting this content taken down and I can tell you that so many women that come to us, that's what they want. They've been to the police and um, they were told, why'd you take the I image in the first place? Why don't you just get off the internet? So again, we need, to, we, we need to learn from each other so that we can develop solutions that will work in every jurisdiction and every con context. And my time is up, but uh, I just want to offer um, that we're willing to work with all of you to help share our learnings. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will turn to our last panelist now, Juan Carlos. Um, to speak to the significance of um, some work where uh, UNFP and Derechos Digitales are doing jointly around what rights-based law reform looks like to address, uh, to address TFGBB and, and why this is an important piece of work. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you to NFPA for the invitation to participate in this. 
I am now saluting you all from uh, Derechos Digitales. We're an NGO working in the intersection of human rights and digital technologies working in Latin America. And I speak also on behalf of my wonderful colleagues who are working in this effort to provide guidance uh, for, uh, for law reform. Uh, I'd like to begin by highlighting the fact that as a civil society organization based in the global majority, we understand that the internet is indeed a place of risk, but it's also a place for opportunity that uh, the di digital realm has meant and has allowed for more spaces to give visibility to social demands, to social justice demands, and also for the demands of combating and preventing uh, gender-based violence, especially that which is facilitated by technology. Um, at the same time, I do wish to acknowledge like the, the significant contributions to this panel, which are a big summary of the amounts and the diversity of the violence that women, gender non-conforming people, LGBTQIA plus people face daily on the internet. But at the same time, the work that Derechos Digitales is conducting is trying to address the fact that we need sensible legislation legislative efforts, standards uh, are being discussed right now. However, how that applies to the internet and to the complexity of the social background of this, these types of violence is a very complex problem. And the legislative side of it is only one part of it. And we need to take it and, uh, into consideration in its right way to balance the rights and, of course, to provide um, the solutions that the legislation by itself is able to provide. We need to also understand that complex social issues are not going to be just solved by virtue of uh, enacting new laws, but that we also need enforcement and we need um, a level of understanding throughout the, the system that should be uh, reflected as well. So we need to develop legal frameworks that address technology-facilitated gender-based violence from the perspective of balance. Um, and also taking into consideration that the privacy of the survivors themselves, their freedom of expression, their access to information are relevant also for them. It's not just a matter of the rights of the people who are committing the offenses. So because these are social problems that disproportionately affect people in situations of vulnerability and women also in the public sphere, we need to defend an intersectional approach that addresses contextual and social differences. And also that there are groups that we know from our situated perspective that may distrust institutions, that because of the history of marginalization, do not trust that the existing institutions uh, that enforce the law are sufficiently capable of addressing their needs or their expectations of reparation. And finally, that we need to consider the need to educate the operators of the justice system, from the police to the judges and everyone in between, because these are complex issues that are not solved just by text. Um, finally, uh, we understand also that criminalization of violence is not by itself a solution to a multi-layer multi social problem, and that we need further action to educate and to prevent violence. But when we decide to take legislative action, it is important not to create further violence nor further infringements of rights. Uh, again, going back to my initial point, the internet has become fundamental for the exercise of rights, including access to information, including sexual and reproductive rights, and the capacity to associate and to uh, defend those rights and to promote those rights and to create change in policy as well. Uh, and so it's therefore very important to combat violence. Uh, so we need to strengthen rights around technologies themselves with a strong focus on privacy, security, freedom of expression, including tools like encryption and anonymity and, and education, um, and to defend those as m ways in which we can use technology to not just promote rights, but also to create social change. Any type of legislation that aims to prevent and combat uh, technology facilitated gender-based violence need to take all of that into consideration and we expect that guidance to help in that effort. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, with that, we've, I think we've heard across an ecosystem of stakeholders who are, who are working to hold, um, you know, to, to hold tech spaces um, to account to safety for, for women and girls. With that, I might turn to see whether there's any questions in the room or online. Oh, here we, I think. 
Yeah, I think probably this is the most colorful panel I have seen so far. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, so my name is Samirat uh, from um, Sri Lanka. I'm working for Dialogue. Uh, it's a telecommunication company. Uh, so in line with you know what we discussed, I think thank you very much for those uh, insightful stuff. Uh, what we got from all the panelists, uh, thank you for that. Uh, so we have not to that extreme. Maybe Ar Iraq, you know what, what what I heard, you know like it's my God. Uh, we can imagine, you know, what's going on there. But we are probably lucky. But, you know, we do have challenges the all, all the way there in Sri Lanka as well. So what we do is we are uh, c coming up with the uh, online security bill, okay, which has been drafted and it is getting, you know, kind of public opinions and it is uh, to be passed at the parliament. So I, I would like to ask from the panelists, you know, like maybe what's the kind of experience in your respective countries on online safety? Because maybe that uh, addressed a lot of challenges what we were discussing, okay? Uh, because even in person and, you know, like the trust and the women's safety, children's safety, and all those come into uh, that. So what is your experience? And in your respective countries, wha what are you, uh, where are you in terms of, you know, coming up with the online uh, safety bill? Is it passed in your places? You know, what are the challenges? Uh, any advice from the panel based on your experience? Thank you. Um, that's that's a great question. So um, we were established uh, in 2015 as the Children's E-Safety Commissioner, and I think that actually helped us a bit because it came out of a result of tragedy. A well-known um, adult personality was terribly trolled on Twitter as I was applying for a job at Twitter. Um, to start their uh, Australian function, and she ended up taking her life. And a petition went to the government saying, we've got to stop, uh, we, government has to step in. Um, but the ICT minister at the time, who eventually became our prime minister, um, had been an ICT entrepreneur, knew that if we started with children, nobody could argue that cyberbullying of children and child sexual exploitation was a freedom of expression issue. So we started there, and then we layered on different functions. Um, and we've already had a reform of our bill that has now given us um, systemic and process-based powers. But I, I also want to t tackle the issue of anonymity um, because it's more, much more complex than people uh, give it f credit for. And I think what we are struggling now is a, a range of um, human rights that need to be properly balanced. Um, and we see that playing out in the debate around um, child safety and their right to be free from violence and child dignity through the scanning of known child sexual abuse images versus the uh, privacy of adults. But I was asked by a senator, we should just ban anonymity. And I said, well, one, I don't think the internet is architected that way, and I don't think it's necessarily desirable. And when we think about dissidents and we think about women, most of these adult cyber abuse cases we take are uh, women being doxxed or experiencing um, uh, cyber, cyber stalking, uh, really serious um, online offenses. And what the government decided to do so that people couldn't cowardly hide behind and fake an imposter account is they've given us powers with lots of accountability and transparency provisions behind it to um, go to the platforms and ask for um, what is called basic subscriber information as the basis for um, further investigation. So most of the companies pick up things like IP addresses, MAC addresses, device IDs, only for the purposes of issuing um, notices when, when our investigators have found that they have violated the law. Um, but that doesn't mean you should undermine anonymity totally. We just need to find ways to eliminate that cloak of a, um, anonymity um, as a way of abusing others with total impunity. Sure. So in Iraq, we do have mm -hmm. some existing legislation. Um, but I would say that it's not well understood. I would say the crime isn't well understood. And the gaps in the legislation are it doesn't mandate an institution um, to handle this type of crime. And so uh, it's ill-suited to the, ki the kinds of crimes that are have, em uh, have emerged. And I would say that um, uh, it is also being used on the other side to restrict, <coughs> to restrict freedoms, to restrict um, participation in social media, so uh, to, to be used against journalists. So I think it's... The, the legislation isn't really sufficiently targeted. I would say that in the public justice system, we lack confidentiality, privacy, 
um, and the skills to do the appropriate kinds of investigations that are needed here, the technical skills, the forensic ability. So I think we need a, a major overhaul um, and trying to find a way to, to get that legislation so that it is respecting rights at the same time um, really equips the government agencies with the, with the uh, mandate um, and the capacity to, to address the kinds of uh, violence that we're facing. <laughs> well, we had, um, tuvimos muchos problemas para aprobar esa ley. A mí me gustaría que lo dijera. No fue fácil. Um, we had many issues when addressing, when publishing this law. It wasn't easy. Eh, hablamos con Facebook, con Twitter, hablamos con varias plataformas que no querían eh, sentirse involucradas en esto. We talked vi with various platforms like Facebook and Twitter and others that didn't want to get involved and participate. Mm, pero llevamos los testimonios de, de madres y de mujeres víctimas, madres de, de, de niñas y de adolescentes víctimas, y eso nos ayudó muchísimo a que Facebook y Twitter cambiaran mucho su, su situ la situación. And we took the stories of women and their daughters, uh, the, um, I forgot the word, the statements, the um, uh, testimonies, thank you, of sí. women and their daughters, and we brought them to Facebook and Twitter, and that made them ch change their mind. Sí. Y, y logramos finalmente esta reforma al, al Código Penal para que se transformara en un castigo, no nada más en, un, en una descripción de conducta, sino que fuera, eh, fuera eh, pues castigada. Pero además tiene la obligación la plataforma de no subir las escenas y si las escenas se suben eh, sin el consentimiento de ella, inmediatamente deben de bajarlo. Yes, so we took this and transformed it into a bill in order to um, mm -hmm. uh, penalize and criminalize this issue. And um, also platforms have the responsibility and they should be accountable of taking down um, this type of material that is compromising the, the safety of, of women and girls. Y finalmente decir que ha, ha provocado suicidios esta situación en el, en el mundo. Y por eso cuando dimos las, los, las gráficas, los niveles de, de suicidio, de intento de suicidio y suicidio de las adolescentes, esto sí ya pues, comprometió más a las plataformas. Y también el hecho de que el suicidio de la adolescencia ha aumentado mucho, fue un importante factor para las plataformas para tomar en cuenta y también cumplir. And sorry, I also want to add something, and thank you very much for 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 those senator for your words. <laughs> um, I think well, in the sense uh, we've been working with this issue as well for for many years now, and uh, what we've seen with our members is that of course it's a multi-layered uh, problem, so it's it 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 needs a multi-layered response, right? It's not only responsibility of governments, but it's also responsibility of the society also for, for the platforms in that sense. So what we see is that first, national contexts are very important to take into account. Each national context is very different. So if you have civil society organizations or members from civil society or even, individu even individuals or women and girls that can participate in the, shape in, in, the sh in the shaping of these laws or these actions, it is very important that these, these are taken into account. Research, a lot of research needs to be done um, to in order to face this problem. And one one thing that Juan Carlos mentioned was um, also uh, how everyone um, inside the judiciary system also needs to be trained. You need to be sen sen sensitive. How do you say it? Like S yes. <laughs> you need to be gender sensitive, right? Because you're dealing with gender issues. So it's something that also needs to, to be um, uh, implemented, for example, in some criminal justice systems. Um, another thing that we worry about is that um, often states respond with conservative and moralistic protectionist measures. And this has the consequences of censoring and limiting speech. So it's also important to consider rights such as right to safety, movement, participation in public life, freedom of expression, privacy, 
Shame is often used with victims and uh, survivors, so this is also an important issue to take into account. But as I mentioned before, it's a multi-layered problem. We, I think in, in, in our point of view, we still need a lot of information, but we need a multi-layered response. Uh, everyone is responsible. We're all responsible for this problem, and we, we all need to... Um, we we all need to be part of the solution, right? So um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Would did you want to come in on that Very question before I? Very briefly, I just want to point out uh, on the subject of legislation and how it can be misused. There was research that was published earlier this year, conducted by Derechos Digitales with support from APC and also relying on, on prior research by other organizations such as Policy and Body and Data and others, that reflects also how existing laws can be used negatively and impact the victims of violence themselves, either through the use of the prosecutorial system in a, in a manner that is against the purposes of the same laws or because of the laws that are poorly drafted. So it's very important to also consider that the systems themselves are something that goes well beyond just the institutional frameworks and, and we need also to see how they operate in practice. is a consistent theme across the world in terms of um, law enforcement, understanding how this manifests. Uh, I, I mean, AVOs are hard, um, apprehended violence orders are hard to um, enforce anyway, but then when you put it into the digital realm, it gets even um, more difficult. Um, but we've just been having a discussion this past week in Australia about how few offenders of child sexual abuse are actually prosecuted. Um, and the case of women who have experienced image-based abuse, and let's be honest, there are still gendered double standards that exist that make image-based abuse the scarlet letter of the digital age. If you're a woman showing a, you know, a little bit of cleavage, you're a woman of ill repute. When it's a man showing his six-pack, it's, it's a totally different thing. And so when women, um, one of the reasons we focus on taking the content down as quickly as possible as that release, relieves the emotional and mental distress. If they decide to take um, a former partner um, because it's relationship retribution to court, not only do they have to face them and that family, they often have to introduce the images that caused them the distress in the first place as evidence in court. Um, so we really need to change these processes to um, minimize <laughs> the distress and re actually get some outcomes against the offenders and perpetrators. Thank you, I think that's such a valid point about having that intermediary between survivors and a very complex and often convoluted justice system which is quite difficult to navigate, particularly if you're a survivor of violence and already recurring trauma. Please, I might take one more question from the room or Angela, I think you also put your hand up. So maybe two questions from the room and then we have one more question online. So we'll we'll. Okay, hello, uh, thank you for the panel and such important discussions. My name is Emanuela, I'm from Brazil. I represent Instituto Alana, which is a child rights defense organization. And one thing that's a little on my mind and I would like if you guys could explore a little bit more, it's because when we talk about accountability, we are norm normally talking about the need for data and the need for research and the need to understand the bigger complex. And my fear is to depend too much on the platforms for that. And how can we integrate more and to generate data from our public system, from our assistance, and what kind of data would we need in that sense to understand and maybe not depend so much on the platforms? What kind of disaggregated data do you guys think that would be important? And what service could it be integrated so we had a, a whole picture that did not depend or maybe Maybe not people don't you know flag all the content that happens online. They suffer for violence, but how can we you know give more visibility to this topic through public system? So that's my question. Thank you. Um, I I spent 22 years in the technology industry, so you know I have some knowledge about. <laughs> Uh, where systems lie and what com companies are doing, but in this role, uh, for six years, I was asking the same major companies, you've created photo DNA, it's been used for 10 years, um, 
what services are you using this on? Are you eating your own dog food? Why are your, uh, you know, how, why is it so hard to report abuse? And are you scanning or not? And because I never got straight answers to straight, straight questions, when we reformed our bill, I went to the government and said, one, we need to know that companies are following the basic online safety expectations, and I need legal compulsion powers um, to be able to ask the questions that need to be answered, not the selective transparency we see in the transparency reports. So um, we, we released our first um, transparency report in December of last year against um, Apple, Microsoft, Meta, Skype, WhatsApp, Snap, and Omegle, and found that the richest um, most well-resourced and ubiquitous tech, tech companies in the world um, were not doing enough, some not doing anything to address child sexual abuse. So I was frankly surprised that more people weren't more outraged um, when we came out with that data. It, that's starting to change. Uh, Professor Hani Farid, who invented photo DNA, just um, put a piece up in the San Francisco Chronicle today. There's something called the Heat Initiative in the U.S. where <laughs> they're they're actually focusing on Apple um, and saying, you know, privacy and safety shouldn't be considered false binaries. There needs to be balance. But um, you know, doing only reporting 234 instances of child sexual abuse when you have billions of handsets in the world, where whereas Meta um, reported 27 million there's something wrong here. You're obviously either not scanning or uh, allowing reports, but probably both, and this is what our report found. So we'll, we'll have a big um, announcement next week around another seven companies. Um, so we'll slowly, slowly, just as Brandeis said, sunlight is the, disinfect the best disinfectant, and so we do need to shine a light on these shortcomings, but then we need all of you again, to build that outrage and to demand um, more change. Um, you know, we can do certain things as a small regulator, but we do need a global movement here. Thank you. I might, Angela, I might turn to you for your question and then we, we will have to wrap up the session. Um, thank you so much. My name is Angela Minayo. I work for an ICT policy think tank that is based in Nairobi, Kenya. I have worked on online safety for now two years. I'm a lawyer by training, and now I work on gender and technology. My question is very simple. I believe that there is consensus about the harms of online gender-based violence, but we do not see this consensus turn into any tangible outputs, especially on the global stage. I have attended IGF since 2017, and we have always had a session or another on online safety. But every time we come back here and we talk about the same issues and how uh, terrible it is, but we don't see movement at the international forum. What is stopping us, and how can we intervene in these international processes that can bring real change for women? Um, my second question is uh, around online child abuse and uh, women's safety. So I made an observation that online child abuse is uh, very much well understood even in the law enforcement sector, you'll be surprised. So uh, we have in Kenya something known as the Child Protection Unit um, based at the DCI, and they understand very well how to handle child abuse uh, complaints. But then you ask them, how, how about women and girls who are above 18 years, and they don't, they don't even consider them as victims to be taken care of in the legal system. So there's almost a um, protection to children up to the age of 18 in my country at least. And then from 18, you're a woman and your harm is normalized, violence against you is normalized and you're not even considered a victim. So those are my two statements, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, um, Angela. I, very quickly on the global stage, I think, we're lucky to have Ellen here from Young Women, but last, uh, you know, in March, the, the entire Commission of Status of Women was dedicated to gender and technology, and I think there was a really strong focus around technology facilitator, gender-based violence, integrated into global outcomes documents and language. So I think at a, at a global level, there is certainly movement around building international language uh, and, and policy, and I think at a national level, we're very much seeing, you know, movements around different countries implementing laws and policies. Um, I will pass to the senator. Si, bueno, uh, let me tell you that I was in Beijing in 1995, 1995, and everyone told us that we were, que estábamos locas. <laughs> locas, crazy. They told us, you are crazy. They didn't want us to talk about violence against women 
or um, or this kind of issues about uh, penalties and you know and now it, yo yo veo que hemos avanzado mucho si lo puedes decir pero muchísimo hace 30 años este tema era del brujas era un tema prohibido y ahora vamos muy avanzadas pero yo creo que el reto es los juzgadores y los ministerios públicos creo que ahí es donde mm -hmm. tenemos So the senator is sharing that she has seen a lot of progress in the last 30 years and that we should definitely take that into account. It has completely shifted for 30 years, so that's something to, to remember. And that the problem now is the judiciary system, um, public ministries and judges. This is the, the most important problem, uh, as she shared just now. Thank you. I, we do have to wrap up now, um, but I will ask um, Eko Norita, the uh, representative of our Japan UNFPA office, to, to close us out today. I'll stand up so you can sit here, because I think there's a... Well, well, thank you so much. Um, six is a great number here, but I thought I would be the lucky seven barging in to close this session, but it's really you know, excellencies and, you know, all these leaders and, and wonderful colleagues and also friends, you know, within the community for being here to this really rich conversation around, you know, disrupt harm, accountability for safe to, safer internet. Um, since we keep talking about the importance of multi-stakeholder conversations over the last couple of days, I mean, what does that really mean? And I think you heard that here, right? More specifically, you know, we need to come together across governments, you know, regulatory bodies, CSOs, businesses, and rights-based organizations to really collaborate more efficiently to be able to disrupt this harm over the internet that we see so, so frequently. Um, I think we also have to acknowledge at this moment the awe and the power of civil society organizations. I think it's really important that they're here today at IGF and, you know, especially including those led by APC and Audrey. Uh, primarily, I, I think what I was talking to Alex earlier this afternoon and saying, you oh, know, they, they belong here, right? They, they are entities that belong here to really make that voice be heard from the ground because that's really important. We're not just talking sort of in theory. So just going over what we discussed today, we learned about the experiences of one of the only intergovernmental regulatory bodies, the e-safety commissioner of Australia, and also from the legislative scenarios of Mexico, all these steps taken, and from feminist digital rights activists whose global work you know, inspires really all of us and from community leaders in Iraq, one of the you know, toughest countries to really handle and face this gender-based violence issue, not only in online, but on the ground in person. And I think what this event did was to really put a human face over topics that are often so high up in the techno technology world. And I think that's really important that we put this human face to it. And I think it's interesting for me because we, we use you know, this online digital technology, the accountability of it is unlike other crimes like human, you know, crimes against humanity like genocide. They're accountable. Who do we per put kind of accountability to it? Um, when we have things like AI, suddenly that accountability is really much more difficult to put a finger to. So at UNFPA, you know, we're really working hard to try and as one of the transformative goals to end gender-based violence. And as Maria Ressa mentioned earlier, it's not okay, if it's not okay to do it in person, that it's not okay to do it online either. So, you know, I think we work with governments, policy makers like yourselves, and I just want us to finally maybe say that you're all here in your own positions, whether civil society or not. I think it's good for us to continue to use this platform as a way to interact and also continue the momentum of movement so that this becomes a place of exchange and also amplifying the voices of you know what is really important so with that i know i have to do this i have to extend my gratitude to everyone who made this event possible special thanks go to our honorable senator camarena 
and also Julie Iman Grant, Sherry Kraham Talabani, Juan Carlos, Laura and Carla Valescos Ramos, and also Alex, Stephanie, and Eva, our team from UNFPA, and to all of you who have come here today to really make this conversation very rich. So thank you so much. <laughs>